Well, good morning, or good afternoon, good evening, <laughs> wherever you are, welcome. Glad to have everyone here. Looks like everybody is uh, pumped and primed and ready to write. So I just want to say hello, and um, yeah, it's it's good to be here. Uh, last month, uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to do this show because I had to go through some surgery, and uh, it... it um, it, it kind of sucked, but I'm back. I'm feeling good, so I'm ready to write. So how's everybody doing? Let me know in the chat. Let's see. And uh, folks were commenting on what they were working on. Drone Pro working on finishing a Kindle Vela chapter now, striving to hit 2K words today. Let's see. Natalie, good morning. Oh, first time. Well, welcome, Natalie. First time power hour. Uh, making one of these live, I normally work along with the recordings later. So we'll certainly, certainly welcome. All right, let's see. Nicholas Cato Strode, hello. A. Anderson, hello. SD Houston, hello. And uh, let's see, Natalie's going to be working on a new writing spreadsheet. The goal is to do something lower pressure than my old one. Yeah, getting that writing, writing spreadsheet is uh, uh, always important. And uh, Journeys into Love. Love that name. That's the name of a, a great Lonnie Liston Smith song. Um, working on a 40-day spiritual guidebook for the alpha female who's in the prime of her career and facing real burnout and health consequences as she's not honoring her personal boundaries. Very interesting. Well, welcome. All right. Travis Stoll, welcome. 
All right, uh, been MIA. Yeah, it's been it's been it's been a minute since you've been here. So welcome back, my friend. All right, uh, Ruth. Happy Saturday. Heat wave. Yes, here in the UK. Yeah, I think it's a heat wave everywhere. It's uh, it's pretty hot here. It's actually well, it's actually cooled down a little bit in Iowa. It hasn't been as hot uh, lately, but um, yeah, it definitely has been a heat wave. All right, Carried. Welcome, Carried. Been working on my romance short story today and drinking a lovely Gen Plus Orange. Yes, it's been a while since uh, carried has been with us, too. So welcome back, Carried. All right. Yeah, everybody's, everybody's, everybody's pumped up today. This is good stuff. I think we're going to have a really good session. All right, PB Jelly, good morning. I'm working on a paranormal romance. All right, drinking black coffee. Good stuff. All right. Oh, um, SD says, working on AuthorTube writing conference admin stuff less than one week before the conference. If you wouldn't mind dropping a link in there for everybody to know, uh, there's a lot of great speakers at this conference. So um, please, please don't don't be shy on self-promo, um, SD. Please, please drop that link in the chat, and I'll, I'll be sure to share that. All right. <laughs> All right. There's so many comments. I can't uh, I, I can't grab them all. <laughs> I'll, I'll grab a few more here. All right. Jill, good morning from the San Juans. Um, um, oh, Pacific Northwest. OK, I've uh, got my black coffee and ready to write. Good stuff. I had to think about that acronym for for a minute. All right. Oh, Carrie, thank you so much. I appreciate the super chat. All right. Yeah, this is going to be a good good session. I, I, can, I can feel it. All right. Okay. Well, I see a lot of other people in here, but I, I, we're just going to go ahead and get started. So um, first things first, I want to get some news out of the way. Um, if you haven't noticed already, I did throw it in the video description. I have made the audiobook versions to my last two writing books, the Author Estate Handbook and the Author Air Handbook. I've put those up on YouTube. So it's like eight hours worth of writing material. Uh, if you If you ever need any help on planning your estate, that sort of thing. I, it is now available on YouTube for people to listen to. And, um, you know, you you might be asking, why would you put that on YouTube? I don't know. It was just an idea that I had. I saw somebody else do it, and I thought, oh, that's that's kind of cool. We'll, we'll see what happens. Um, it, it's actually helped a lot. <laughs> so um, just check it out. There's, I, there are some ads. There's only one. There's, there's an ad in the beginning, and there's an ad when you get to the end. Otherwise, you know, I don't believe in breaking up like an audiobook video, like a seven-hour video with ads. I'm not going to be mercenary about it. But you can listen to it for free, and the links are in the video description for both books. Um, also, another thing, I just want to let you all know, I am going to be on the Creative Pen here pretty soon. I think I'm talking with Joanna next week, and I'm not sure when um, when it's going to come out, but um, we're going to be talking about, wait for it, estate planning <laughs> for authors. So I'm looking forward to sitting down with her again. That'll be my third time on the Creative Pen, I think. So it's always a lovely, lovely opportunity to chat with Joanna. And then later this month, I don't know if any of you are going to be out and about uh, in Manhattan, but I will be in Manhattan, New York City, at the Writer's Digest Annual Conference. I'll be speaking on I don't even have to say it. Estate planning, <laughs> and then also I, I think I'm doing. I think I'm supposed to do a marketing talk and and a panel for writers. So uh, I'll be in um, I'll be in Manhattan, uh, July 29th, 30th, and 31st. If you happen to be at the conference, please let me know. I would love to say hello. And um, yeah, it'll be it'll be cool to go back to to New York City. It'll be kind of weird. I was t- I was talking to someone yesterday, and they're like, Yeah, I'll, if you had any favorite restaurants, they're you know in Manhattan, the, in Midtown, they're probably all gone. <laughs> Because the pandemic wiped them out, so that's kind of depressing. But uh, we'll 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 see. So, and then um, I, I'm not sure if any of you are children's book writers, but the first weekend in August, I'm speaking at the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators annual conference. It's a virtual conference. Uh, I'm I'm doing just like a like an intro to self publishing. So those are kind of some of the events that I've got coming up. If anyone is interested, but um, just want to make sure that uh, uh, I always share that. Because people are like, why didn't you tell me you were going to be appearing here, here, and there, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, that is the news that's up with me. Um, another thing I want to uh, let you all know, you all know every year I do my Beast Mode Challenge. This year it's coming up on August 1st. Normally I do it on July 1st, but with my surgery and stuff, I, I just wasn't able to do it. But uh, August 1st, 
Beast Mode is happening again. I might do it a little bit shorter this year. I may not do 90 days. Um, once I get to once I get to like day 80 or so, things start going off the rails. So I might only do like 60, 75 days worth of Beast Mode. But um, yeah, so that's going to be fun. And usually with Beast Mode, what I like to do is I like to do more power hours. So probably what we'll do is if I can, um, just depending on schedules and stuff, I may do two power hours in August just uh, to kind of help help with that. So if you want to go into beast mode with me, let's do it. So I'm writing book three in my Chicago Rat Shifter series. Uh, I'm, I'm, gonna tr- I'm trying to get that done before August because this will be the last book in the series. So um, that way I can, I can get a trilogy together, kind of knock it all out. All right. So, um, yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be really, really fun. So let's go over uh, the the – the rules here, because I know we've got some folks here who this is their first time. Um, maybe it's your first time, period. So with these power hours, what I like to do is I will put on some music, put on put on a calming background, and then we're going to write for 20 minutes. All right. And the counter will the timer will go down on the screen when the timer is over or before that, before that, feel free to write on whatever, you, whatever you're working on. So you got a manuscript, you got a spreadsheet that you're working on, you got some research that you're working on. Doesn't matter, all right? We're, we're all, we're, we're, we work on whatever we need to work on to be productive. And then when the timer goes down, I'll come back on, we'll shoot the breeze, I'll answer any questions you all have, uh, we'll just chat, have some fun for a few minutes, and then we'll go into another session, then we'll chat, chill out, then go into a third session, and then you all know that I will stay on the chat until everyone's questions are answered. All right, so um, this will be fun, and uh, like I said, I always love that we have new new timers on here, and I love the fact that I have to repeat myself <laughs> to go through this. And you all know, uh, you all know what to do when somebody comes in the chat and is asking, "What is he doing? Why, why is why is it quiet? Why is there music?" You all got my back. All right, so let's. Let's go into it here. So I'm going to put some music on the screen. Oh, uh, Natalie, I'm sorry. I, sh- I should have uh, explained. So beast mode is when I go basically once a year, it's, it's when I go into a mode where I write as much as humanly possible. All right. And the reason I do this is because summertime here in, in my hemisphere is generally the time of great forgetting. That's when people forget to write because it's nice outside. And so I like to try to ignore that and focus on writing as much as I can during the summer so that I can have a really good word count and productivity to show for it. So what I do is I go into beast mode and I talk about all the things I'm doing every day to write as many words as possible. And last year, I think I published like 10 books or I wrote 10 books during 90-day period. And the year before that, I did like 12. So um, I, I kind of go into insane, crazy word counts, and I invite everybody to follow me. I invite everyone to go into beast mode of their own. And so that is what that is. All right, so I had to hit that here. All right. Good, good stuff. Love the questions, all right? So let's go into it, everybody. Let's get the first timer on the screen. Good luck with your writing session. And Let's get to it.
All right, time is up. How did everyone do? Let me know. For uh, first-timers here, what I always like people to do is put in the number of words that you wrote and then how you're feeling. All right, so we can all celebrate the, the word count that we got over the last 20 minutes. And then I've always believed that if you feel good when you're writing, your words are going to be that much better. All right, so we'll wait for the, the word counts to come in here. <clears throat> Oh, Keto Cutie, uh, so glad to see you feeling so well. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Jill says, yay, I need beast mode. I need beast mode too. <laughs> I really do. All right. All right, Deborah Edwards, hello. Hello, Deb, welcome back. And Haley Miss, the time of great forgetting. Yes, uh, that is what Dean Wesley Smith calls uh, the time. Usually, it's what it refers to is the time during the summer. As I said before, when it gets really nice outside and people are going on vacations, they're spending more time outside, maybe doing sports, all the things that uh, summer invites. And then the next thing they know, they get to September and they have no words to show for it. So it usually hits around late May, goes until around September, around Labor Day-ish. And around that time, around September, is when people start waking up and they're like, oh my God, I haven't written anything. And so then there's a mad dash to the end of the year to try to make up for everything that happened in the summer. And my thought was, you know, I've never had that problem personally. Um, but my thought was, well, if it's true that the summertime is that time of great forgetting when people forget to write, what if I made summertime like insane? Like what if what if what if I wrote more during the summer than most people write in an entire year, you know? Like what would that do? And so that's how I came up with this idea of beast mode. And also I came up with it during the pandemic. The you know, the first year of was 2020 when uh, things were just kind of crazy and um you know, I think a lot of us probably weren't writing as much as we would have liked to, if at all, during 2020. And I said, well, I need, I need to be productive. And so the idea is, you know, you write, you have, if you have an amazing, so if you have an amazing January through May and an amazing October or September through December, what if you could have an even amazing like summer? Like what would that do for your year, you know? And it makes a, it's, it's made a big difference for me personally. So yeah, good stuff. All right, let's see some of the words coming in here. All right, Travis, I'm continuing a piece I started two months ago, and I'm a little intimidated by how well I wrote then compared to how I'm producing at this moment. Proof that writing is not immune to atrophy. Yes, you are correct, but also don't let your brain play tricks on you. Uh, you know, two months, two months, yeah, I mean, I de there's definitely definitely some creakiness that can go on after two months. I mean, if you if you write something and then you pick up, you're definitely going to be creaky. There's no no doubt about that. But I I I I I don't think that people lose their writing skills that quickly. You know, like if it was years, yeah, you know, a few days, I don't think so, but. You know, the, the trick is just to, it, it's like jumping in a pool, you know, like when you, when you first dip your toe in a pool, like it's super cold, but then your body temperature normalizes, you know, it adjusts to the, to the water after just like 30 seconds, you know, you just got to throw yourself in the pool and it sucks, but you'll be glad you did it when you did it. So sounds like that's what you're doing. And uh, hopefully, um, you know, by the time you get to your next writing session, it won't be as bad. All right, PB Jelly, 801, so not bad, not bad at all. That's actually that's actually really good for uh, um, 20 minutes, you know, because, I mean, really, just multiply multiply your number by three, and that's your hour hourly word count. So, you know, uh, 2,400 words in an hour is, is a good number. All right, Journeys into Love, 818, and so freaking happy right now. That's fantastic. All right, Drone Pro, I felt okay. Good, good. Uh, you know, not amazing, not horrible, but okay is okay is good. Carry it, 302, feeling pretty good. I'm writing a horrific scene, but pretty good. All right. Christina Booth, 395, finally got focused. And uh, Nicholas, just chipping away at small inconsistencies between my two fantasy novels. Feels good like combing your hair. All right. SD, 179. 
dot C. Not a lot, but I'm happy with them, and that's that's all that matters. All right. A Anderson, 200, but did a lot of backtracking. Yeah, I did some backtracking too. In fact, I don't. I think I actually have a negative work count for the last 20 minutes because <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm getting back into the swing of things myself, and um, I'm doing some looping. So 79, Lynn, EGADS, is that all? Hey, that's okay. You know, you, you got to do the 79 so that you can do the rest of the words for your day. Just think about it like that. Uh, Mutavani asks, how many books have you written so far? Hopefully, I've, hopefully I said your name correctly. Uh, I think my, I, up, I just recently updated my marketing materials for to say 80 plus. I actually don't think I'm at 80. I think I'm like at 77, 78. But with my Indie Author Confidential series, there's at least two more of those coming. That's going to put me over 80. So, I th- yeah, I think I'm at 77. So... I'm pretty close, and beast mode is going to put me over over 80. I think I'm projected to get like high 80s at the by the end of this year. So, yeah, fun, fun. I, I lose track of how many books I've written at this point. Um, all right, Ruth, cut around 500 words from a 2K draft chapter. Yeah, it's always easier to chop than to write, but that's all good. Hey, Roland Denzel in the house, 303 words. Nicely done. Good to have you with us. Journeys into love. There seems to be a tremendous chad and oh, a lag. Oh, here we go again. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, it's not affecting everybody. If there is a lag, I'm sorry, everybody. YouTube, um, the YouTube gods are not smiling on us today. All right, uh, Natalie, finish the main template. Okay, so so we're making progress on the 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 template. Good stuff. And uh, Adrian, are your books available in bookstores? The answer is you can ask your bookstore to order one of my books if you would like, and they have the ability to do that. So certainly um, they are available for bookstores to order. Are Is there some bookstore out there carrying my books? I don't know. Maybe. I hope so. <laughs> uh, but uh, I don't pay that much attention to it. I just make it available so that if readers go into their local bookstore and ask for, say, the author estate handbook, the bookstore will be able to order it. All right. Now, will they order it? I don't know. I don't know. It depends on the bookstore. All right. Depends on the bookstore. Some bookstores don't want to order indie books. Uh, Some bookstores, um, you know, it's an economic thing. So uh, it just depends. Just depends. All right. Keto Cutie, 413. Good vibes. I got sucked into the scene I'm writing. I love that when it happens. Yeah, me too. Uh, There's nothing better than... um, Nothing better than getting into flow. Although, there's, here's an interesting fact, and this is something uh, that my data has told me. So you all know that I'm, I, I'm big into data. And um, I, for a long time, I, don't, I haven't been doing it with this novel, but for the last probably 10 novels, I've been tracking like my word counts. And I basically, so, so what I do is I, when, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm outlining, because you, know, you guys know I outline as I go, I, I, I record the word counts of the books that I'm writing, you know, the chapters that I wrote, wrote whatever. I can't talk today, but you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> what I was trying to say is I, I, I record my word counts. And then what I did for a long time is I would track the, like my emotion, like how I was feeling about something. And what I would also do is I would track the flow, whether, whether I was in flow for that particular chapter. So like, for example, keto, like the chapter that, that you wrote, if I was writing a chapter like that and I wrote it in flow and it felt like, you know, time kind of sped up or slowed down and I felt like I was in the zone, I would actually mark those chapters where I felt like that. And then what I did is when I sent the chapters to my editor, I actually tracked how many edits I got per chapter, you know, like I found a way to do that. It's not that hard, but I found a way to do it like with automation. And what I found, and again, this is just my data, it's my data, what I found is that the chapters that I wrote in flow actually had more errors and edits in them than chapters that were not written in flow. You, you, you check it out for yourself. You do your own research and maybe it'll work. So what I learned is, you know, it, it sounds like, oh, that's depressing, right? It's actually not depressing. It's actually really helpful because I know that those are the chapters that maybe I want to spend a little bit more time on when I'm revising. All right. And so that ends up helping you get to a like a, a cleaner manuscript. And those are chapters you can have your editor spend a little bit more time on too if you want. So I don't I don't know what that has to do with anything. I was just trying to stall time for people uh 
putting in comments. <laughs> All right. Uh, Krish, any advice on doing the chosen one trope well? I really like chosen one as an idea, but I'm f- afraid I'll run into usual cliches. Yeah, I haven't written any chosen. You know, that's that's one trope I don't. Yeah, I've written one chosen one, but it wasn't like a deliberate chosen one. It just that it, it. Yeah. So so technically, no, I haven't. Cho- deliberately chosen to write that trope, pun fully intended. Um, I would say read a lot of books with chosen one tropes and look at the reviews of those books. This is one trope that tends to be a lightning rod. People either love it or they will rip on it in reviews. And look at the people that love it and see what they're saying and just write the, write those things down. And then look at the people that hated it and then write write those things down. And then I think you can find the common ground of things that maybe you should avoid. All right. But ultimately, I think you should tell the story that's on your heart. Um, but this is one you, you may want to pay a little bit of, uh, of attention to and what the readers are, uh, readers are saying. All right. So, okay. Well, folks, it's that time to jump into our second, uh, second timer. Any questions that come in at this point, I'll get to them during our next break. I promise. All right. So let's get the timer on. And don't forget, if you do have a question or a comment, put it in the co- put it in the chats. Like I said, I won't I won't drop off of this call till I answer everyone's questions. All right. So timer is going up on the screen, and let's get to it. Happy writing, everybody.
All right, everybody. So my neighbor has decided to just mow their lawn. So if you hear uh, like a whirring motor sound, that's what that is. Because this microphone picks up everything, even what my neighbors three doors down are thinking. So uh, my apologies on that, but hopefully it'll be over soon. So let me know what you wrote and uh, how you're feeling. Okay. So we had some questions come in uh, just uh, before the break. The first question was... From Stealth Poet, is this Lo-Fi Girl, the music that we're listening to? No, it is Chill Hop. So Lo-Fi Girl is cool. I, li I dig Lo-Fi Girl, uh, but I like Chill Hop too. And uh, they, al they allow, um, I think Lo-Fi Girl does this too, but uh, Chill Hop allows you to use their music on your streams as long as you give them credit. So definitely check out Chill Hop. They just came out with a summer collection. Um, I'm not as big of a fan as, of their summer collections as I, I like their winter and winter and fall collections better I, I don't know I, I think the artists just they do better with like winter vibes personally but um, there's still some pretty good stuff on their summer album so you can check it out all right um, Natalie interesting data regarding flow and edits is that consistent for you across fiction and nonfiction yes it is um, I think flow is flow it doesn't really matter what you're writing and it doesn't really yeah so, yeah, it, it, I, I've noticed it with my, my nonfiction, too. So uh, very, very interesting find. It was one of those finds that, like, surprises you. Like, you wouldn't think – like, it, it's not intuitive, right? Because you think, oh, you, you wrote it in flow. It's going to be amazing, right? But um, actually, it needs a little bit more work sometimes. Okay. Uh, Drone Pro. How do you deal with imposter syndrome? I went to the bookstore yesterday and picked up Stephen King's Carrie. I read a couple pages and got so depressed – comparing my writing to his well you know it, it Stephen King is a master right I mean it doesn't really matter what you think about Stephen King but he, he technically you know craft wise is somebody that's at the top of his craft one of the the best practitioners of the written word it's natural to feel depressed when you compare yourself to him but you know Stephen King had a lot of practice Right. And I think he even admitted, I don't know if this carry is one of the novels where he doesn't remember. Like there's some novels where he, he, I think he said in his his books, he was so drunk, he didn't even remember writing them. So, I mean, think about that for a minute. Right. So it, it's like it's like comparing it, it, it would be like a kindergartner comparing a novel that they wrote or a story that they wrote, per se, comparing that to like the master right I mean, i'm not saying you're a kindergartner but i'm just saying like 
we're new, you know, we don't have that skill level yet. We're still learning. We're still on our journey. And it's natural to feel that way. But at the same time, you almost, you also have to remember that even keeping Stephen King started off like us, right? The only difference between us and Stephen King is that uh, Stephen King has, I would say, a natural talent for this. But I also think Stephen King continues to write. I mean, he's extremely prolific. And yeah, he kept at it. So if we keep at it, we we can be better too. Maybe we won't ever be at the level of Stephen King, right? But um, we can always be better than what we are today. And I think that's something that we should all look forward to. So um, to the question of how you deal with imposter syndrome, just remember that imposter syndrome, it, it's, your, it's your brain playing tricks on you, right? Think about it like this. Everybody feels like they're an imposter. So therefore, no one is an imposter. <laughs> All right. So um, there's not going to be a moment where someone lifts off the masks and say, aha, the jig is up. You are a fraud, sir. It doesn't work that way. Um, Maybe maybe for maybe there will there will be some people who the mask gets lift off lifted off of, but they were probably frauds anyway, and um, they were probably you know I don't know I, I I don't know what else to say other than to try to get you to to say this is, imposter syndrome is not what it's cracked up to be. All right, um, there are millions of other people. In fact, I would almost argue you know this might be a radical this might be a little bit radical. I would almost argue that. If you don't feel imposter syndrome, like that's not normal. You know, I think everybody goes through it. All right. I'll get off my high horse here. All right. Wyland, welcome, Wyland. Super glad to see you full of spirit in life. I was worried about you with the surgery thing. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, 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 I th- things didn't go so well with my surgery. Um, I told you guys last month I had a kidney stone and, um, um, they went in to get it, and they were unsuccessful in being able to get to the kidney stone. I'll spare you guys the details. but So they had to do a temporary operation, and I was in a lot of pain and discomfort for like 14 days. And then the second surgery was successful, but then as a complication of it, I caught a kidney infection. So, um, yeah, that was not, uh, not much fun, but uh, I'm on the back end of it now, so all is good. Uh, the last couple of days, I felt 100%, so I appreciate your well wishes, Wylan. And I am back at it. All right. Uh, Greblox, deep in the editing of a manuscript. First time working uh, with an editor has really helped me see into my own writing. But has there ever been any advice an editor has given you that you've chosen not to take? Sure. All the time. I mean, it, I, can't th- I can't think of any specific examples, but there have been times where my editor sa- has said, uh, hey, why don't you put a comma here? And I'm like, no, I'm not going to put a comma there. Or, you know, they'll say, uh, the character... Should maybe the character should say or feel something like this, and I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, my 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 thing is, to to me, at the end of the day, you are the steward of your own story. Step up, take responsibility for your own story. Don't give that to somebody else. Your editor is a partner. Your editor is someone that you hire to help you with these things, but they are not the end all be all. And at the end of the day you are the one who is responsible for your story so you have to own it to me this this is and I, I've said this a thousand times this this is one of those things where I, I think you could probably drink take a shot every time I say it but hire the right people to begin with right so if you are hiring an editor if you 80 percent of your time really should be spent in finding the right editor all right because if you find the right person, then they're going to give you feedback that is going to serve you and serve your story. Sometimes you can find editors that are not a match for you because sometimes their feedback is more about edifying their own personality than it is fixing your work and and doing right by you and your story. All right. So if you find the right person who's going to do the right thing for you and your story and the work itself, then you can rely on their advice. All right. And so, you know, I my rule of thumb is, you know, Probably 80% of the things the editor is going to say, I'm going to agree with, or I'm going to find some sort of middle ground where, you know, maybe, maybe I I didn't necessarily agree with the feedback, but I do think that they, they were onto something. Right. And then maybe 20, 20% or less of the feedback I'm going to discard. All right. Now, if you find yourself on the other end of that, where 80% of the things that your editor is saying you don't agree with, then very naturally you hired the wrong person. All right. So hire the right person. 
that way you can trust their feedback. Um, but at the end of the day, as I said before, take responsibility for your story. If something doesn't feel right to you, then just discard it. You know, it's the editor doesn't care. They got paid just the same. So um, if the editor does care, then that's another problem. That's probably somebody you need to fire. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it, it happens all the time. It, it's a very natural thing to just have disagreements with your editor, and that's that's perfectly okay. Okay, um, Rose, any tips for writing poetry in dactylic hexameter? Oh, no, I have no no tips. <laughs> I have written some poetry in meter, I think, and um, um, yeah, I don't remember... I don't remember any tips. I don't, I don't remember how I did that. I mean, n- other than, you know, printing it out and, you know, using a pencil to put, put in the stress marks. Um, but I'm sure you're probably already doing that. And that's a very rudimentary um, elementary tip. So, yeah, I got nothing for you, Rose. I'm sorry on that one. Okay. Let's see how everybody else is, uh, everybody else is doing here. Uh, Journeys into Love, 380 words this time. Uh, uh, SD, I did a live stream this morning. My hubby decided to mow the lawn like the last five minutes. Yes, yes, it is what it is. PV Jelly 783 Nicholas, powering through these consistency checks. Drone Pro, 408, feeling connected. SD69, feeling okay about it. Nice, nice, nice. Okay. Um, A. Anderson, I'm not pleased, but I will get better. That is the spirit. Uh, Carry it, 207. I needed 10 minutes to think outthink a, a Deus Machina. Dodged it. Yeah, dodging the Deus Machina is always a good thing. <laughs> Readers don't tend to like them too much, do they? All right, Journeys into Love, not bad. Sounds at all. Uh, happy to be here getting things done. Awesome. Uh, Roland, we have the Olympics here on all three sides. You know, I don't mind the Olympics when like I'm doing a stream or when I'm writing or whatever. But the but when I was recording my audiobook, when I uh, recorded my audiobook for one of my books, that's when all the people came out. I mean, there were people mowing their lawns who their lawns were fine, but oh, I could I'm going to go out and uh, cut my grass half an inch shorter. I just could not get over it, you know. All right. Uh, back to the Stephen King, A. Anderson. Yeah, so to be like Stephen King, drink lots of booze. Yeah, joke. Hashtag joke. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. Don't, 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 uh, don't take drugs to uh, uh, enhance your writing. That uh, that never ends well. Dot <laughs> C. Four hundred thirty-two words. Happy they're flowing again. Fantastic. All right. Uh, Keto cutie. Four forty-three. All right. Good. Good. Oh, Travis had something to say about imposter syndrome. Uh, I too struggled with imposter syndrome. It wasn't until I asked, uh, I was asked to edit a book that I realized just how much I had to contribute. This realization helped me get over the feeling. That's interesting, Travis. I, I've heard people overcome imposter syndrome, but I've never heard heard of uh, like that. That's really interesting. Yeah, comparison is the thief of joy, attributed to Theodore Roosevelt. I didn't know. Th- I didn't know Theo- Theodore Roosevelt said that. I mean, I've heard that that saying i didn't know that that was attributed to him and that is a very true saying good stuff yeah i love the comments coming in here it's good stuff everybody all right all right so we do have some questions coming in uh lynn lynn well hey don't let us stop you 273 words this time writing through the qa all right uh good stuff all right, so I'm seeing some questions come in, so now let's get to those here. Uh, let's see. Wylan, is fiction or nonfiction more lucrative for you? Also, which do you intend to enjoy writing more? Well, the second question, I enjoy writing both equally. Uh, I, I love writing fiction, um, and there's nothing like wrapping up a story and putting another novel on my belt, under my belt. I love that. So there's nothing compares to that, but I also love writing like nonfiction and exploring ideas because, you know, you guys know, I, I love exploring ideas and, um, trying to figure out problems to things and writing nonfiction books is how I do that. And that, uh, I'm in my element there in a way that I'm not when I'm writing fiction. So, um, I love writing both equally and, uh, that's why I frequently switch between them. 
Uh, is fiction or uh, nonfiction more lucrative? It's actually about 50-50, Wylan, actually. Um, fiction is starting to overtake my nonfiction, but it's it's kind of been seesawed over the years. So sometimes sometimes my fiction has done better. Sometimes my nonfiction has done better. Um, now that I've kind of been been a better student of advertising, I've gotten to a point where I'm, I'm at about a 50-50. I'm actually not happy with a 50-50. I would prefer... Um, to be about an 80-20 with fiction being around the 80% mark. Um, I, I prefer to make I prefer to make the majority of my money from fiction. Um, I think that that gives my nonfiction more credibility. But I'm not there yet, but uh, I'll be there at some point. All right. That was a good question. All right. Travis uh, had a two-part question, it appears. I received an ARC directly quoted, um, oh, an ARC that directly quoted me in a section. I know there was absolutely no ill intention, but I'm not convinced they understood my quote based on where it was placed. Part two, what is your boundary when being quoted? If it's not what you intended but doesn't harm, do you just let it go? Um, well, clearly, um, I, I, and you can, you can let me know in the comments, Travis. I don't know if you gave that person permission to, to quote you or not. I mean, generally, I mean... It, a lot of people don't abide by this. But I mean, generally speaking, you're not technically supposed to quote someone without their permission. Um, a quote is copyrighted material. That said, most people aren't going to go crazy over it unless, you know, like you, like in situation you've got where you're, mi you're misquoted or maybe the person doesn't agree with the platform or the person or whatever, some sort of disagreement. Or they're just, you know, they just really want to protect their copyright. I guess to... To start answering your question, um, I actually have never come across this before. I don't pay that much attention. <laughs> I'm sure there are people out there who have, who have quoted me, and I, whatever. I mean, as long as long as they're not saying I'm a fizzy bottom, raggle taggle gypsy, whatever. You know, I don't really care that much. Um, but in this case, it sounds like obviously there's some there's some problems. It, it probably wouldn't hurt you to reach out to the person and just say, hey. Thank you for quoting me. I appreciate it. Just want to clarify something here. <laughs> because, you know, they can always change it in the book. It's, I mean, it, maybe maybe, um, maybe they can change, change the context of the quote without changing their message. Um, but maybe they can't. I don't know. I mean, it... it it sounds like I, it sounds like maybe it's something that you you could rectify with the person if you reached out to them. Um, sometimes sometimes they're not amenable to that. So, yeah, it's one of those things you want you kind of want to tread carefully. But yeah, I mean, if it if it, if I guess if it were me in in your situation, I'm not sure what I would do, other than maybe reach out to the person and feel them out and see where it goes. But honestly, that person, you know, if they didn't get your permission to quote. You know, I mean, they, they kind of didn't respect your copyright. So kind of something to think about. All right. But, you know, sometimes sometimes it's OK to quote folks, you know, in books. You, you generally I, I generally I, I know I have done it at least a couple of times, I think. But I generally shy away from it. And I, I prefer to paraphrase whenever I need to do it. So uh, a lot of things to think about there. OK. Uh, uh, Wylan, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, I find your books to be exponentially better than King's. I like King, but his books bore me to death. Yeah, I won't comment on that. I like King a lot. All right. Let's see what else is going on. Um, uh, Rose, what do you think is the main reason poetry is nowhere near as popular as prose? Do you think it's too complicated to read for most people, too abstract, too oddly structured thoughts? Uh, poetry poetry, poetry is interesting. Um I, it's it's funny you actually mentioned this. I, I think poetry used to be a lot more popular than it is today. I think that the people that do, I, I think it has it gets a bad rap because people people think it's too, yeah. I think to your point, people think it's too complicated. Um, there's there's kind of a societal stereotype of poets being you know wandering around, being lost in their own heads, that sort of thing. And poetry, you know, let's be honest for a while has had a reputation of being a little pretentious. Uh, I think that it's better now than it has been in the past. And I think that um, there are more people who are finally figuring out that poetry is 
po- self-publishing poetry could be lucrative. Ironically, I wrote a book back in 2015 called Indie Poet Rockstar, and I predicted exactly what's happening right now in the poetry market, which is there are going to be indie poets that are killing it. You look at people like Rupi Kaur, um, a lot of the indie poets. I mean, my book predated them, so at least I think it did. Um, at least I wasn't aware of them when I wrote it. So, yeah, I think that um, more people are accessing poetry and poets are reaching audiences. And those people are the other problem with poetry, too, at least now in today in today's digital market is poetry didn't really make the migration to digital very gracefully. It's, it's kind of difficult still to format poetry for for ebooks. And I think that that has also held it back, um, at least for today's digital reader. But, you know. People are reading fewer books now than they ever have in the past. I was just reading a survey by Pew Research. Uh, in 2021, uh, 23% of Americans had admitted um, had admitted to not reading a book within the past year. And you compare that to 1978, and it was only 8% of Americans. So I, I think that um, people are reading less overall. And um, I think if you actually drill down into the genres, I, I think there's far less people reading poetry today than there were you know, back in 1978. But I, I still think that um, poetry's best days are yet to come. Okay, so I know that there are uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of other questions coming in or some additional questions coming in, but let's get to our third session. Um, let's wrap that up, and then I'll come back, and um, we can shoot the breeze some more, folks. So I'm going to bring on the music and the timer. Good luck, happy writing, and let's come back soon.
All right. We did it, everybody. We got to the end of the power hour. Let me know. What I want to know now is I want to know how many words you did this session and then, you know, slash that and then tell me how many words you did for the day so far. All right. So let's celebrate each other's successes here. I'm at, oh gosh, 34 words for the day. <laughs> now, it's not because I wasn't writing. I actually was looping through the uh, this entire time, actually. I've got I basically I'm writing this third novel uh, in my Rat Shifter series, and there are four viewpoint characters. So there's the main character, his sister, and then there's actually two bad guys in this one that I'm cycling between. And I'm kind of like in a weird – like this whole thing feels really disjointed to me so far because I'm like in this weird – like I'll write two chapters from the main character and then I'll write two chapters from his sister and then I'll write two chapters for this villain and then one chapter from the other villain. And then I'm like, but they're, but the, the, the threads, they haven't met yet. Like all four of these characters have not actually been in a room together yet. Or, well, they haven't actually met any of the other characters yet. So like they're all kind of doing their own thing. And so – like I got to, I'm at, I'm at the third point of the novel right now. Like I'm at the third mark and things are kind of start coming together. And so I'm trying to figure out like, okay, crap, whose, ch whose chapter do I write now? <laughs> like, so I'm, I'm struggling with that just a little bit. Um, so I had to go through and loop and I, and I haven't, haven't really written that much in the last couple of days. So it, it, that didn't help either. So, uh, kind of to, tra to Travis's earlier point, uh, uh, I'm feeling a little creaky right now, but uh, I'm getting there. All right, uh, SD, 133 words. Very nicely done. Let's see. Um, Roland, 164 slash 513. Nicely done. Hey, Gussie, 311 dictated words, but join late. That's okay. Uh, on 1,000 words. All right, into the four figures, 1403 for the day. All right, PB Jelly, 2361 total. Hey, I'm glad these power hours help. All right, Journeys into Love, 540 slash 1336 all right 1913 words for the day but and and you got the powerpoint or the uh, not powerpoint my goodness the spreadsheet going i've been doing powerpoints um like i did them all yesterday so i've got powerpoints on the brain <laughs> all right carry 211 700 something that's more more than would have done if you weren't here well that's good i'm glad you were here Glad you got some got got some words in, and uh, folks are making this productive. Nicholas Cato Strode fixed some inconsistencies, and all hung some lampshades and corrected plot holes. So, I've never heard that phrase. So, did you actually hang lampshades, or is that a is that like an idiom? I, I'm confused. <laughs> I, that's kind of a cool uh, cool idiom, though. I, I kind of like that. I don't, Know what you, mean. you have to let me know what you mean by that. All right, uh, Tom Fowler, no new words, but I'm going over editorial revisions. Well, hey, still productive. All right, Travis, I was finally swimming again, 425 plus looping. Well, hey, the good thing about ending in the middle of a swimming session like that is you got something to look forward to, right, the next time you sit down and write. That's always a good thing, too. All right, uh, 21 to 2,100 total words for the day, Carried. Nicely done. All right, not sure of the words, but I typed the words, the end. That's a beautiful thing. So everyone's doing great. Uh, Keto Cutie, 494, 1300. Wyland, no written words, but haven't had a chance to sit down yet. But that's that's okay. That's all good. All right, and uh, Journeys into Love, thank you. Uh, would not have written without this. Uh, feels so productive. That's fantastic. We had some questions and comments come in here. Um, SD wanted to, to t tag on to the conversation that we were having about imposter syndrome and uh, mentions that when I'm actually being helpful for others, I don't feel the imposter syndrome as much. That's absolutely true. And Wylan uh, says, what's the best comment review you've gotten from a reader that made your heart light up? I don't dream of money just of hearing someone say they got something from my work. Yeah, I I, I get so many of them, Wylan. I, I, I can't think of any in particular. Um, you know, I mean, I, I get, you know, fan mail and, and reviews and comments and stuff that, that say very nice things on a, on a daily basis. And I'm always grateful for that. And, um, you know, I read them and, and you know, I, I, I'm always, if I can, I always say thank you. Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head, though. 
Um, and that's mainly because they're all so nice. So, uh, but there have been some that have been like, oh, wow, that's, that's, that's amazing that they said that. I really appreciated that. But, um, yeah, so I, I can't think of any <laughs> off the top of my head. All right. Hunter, uh, is your video on Papyrus Author easy to follow if I open it up and go along? I hope so, Hunter. I hope it's easy to follow. Um, it's. I don't think it's – well, I did two Papyrus Author videos. I did one – that's just like a review of the software. And then I did another one that's a long form, I think like 45 minute video. Uh, it should be fairly easy to follow along. So if you have any questions, let me know. But um, yeah, so Papyrus Author, they're doing some really cool stuff. I'm looking forward to the day they release their mobile version. I think that's going to be a big, uh, a big deal. Okay, uh, Rose, this is really interesting. Um, I found an article where I, I, I guess uh, I was quoted in the very topic. <laughs> it's funny you say that. Uh, in his book, Indie Poet Rockstar, Michael Laurent indicates that some poets don't want to see their collections made available. Oh, there's another part of the comment. Let me grab that. Uh, as ebooks, precisely because digital formats give readers the ability to change how text looks on the page. Yeah, I actually looked up that article and I read it, and that was really interesting, Rose. I, I didn't know that that existed. So that's really cool. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I, I remember when I was doing research for Indie Poet Rockstar, when I was writing it, I was talking to some poets, and they told me that they didn't, they told me that the very thing. I, I don't, you know, I, intend for, I intended for this poem to look this way, this stanza to look this way, and if you put that on an ebook, then it completely takes away the meaning of the form. And, and my argument was always, I understand that you, you wrote it that way, and I, there's nothing you can do about, you know, text that was written, you know, long before ebooks came into existence. And I, I, understand, I understand that part of it. But I think looking forward, I think you have to, I think poets have to think about how can I make my work more accessible, All right? So I guess that got on someone's radar, so that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, that, 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 that book opened up some really, really interesting opportunities. Really, really weird. But ironically enough, that book is how I got, uh, got involved with Ally, the Alliance of Independent Authors, because Orna Ross happened to find it. So it was um, definitely interesting. And I, there's just something else I wanted to say about the quoting thing. And I don't know if I made this clear or not. I don't, I don't know if I did. When, when you're quoting someone in an article like, um, like this woman did, Lisa Rutledge, that's totally fine. You know, I mean, it's uh, to me, it's OK to quote some quote someone's book in your article because you're discussing it. Right. So you, you could you could quote me and say, Michael Laron said, blah, blah, blah. I think he's full of crap. You know, that's fine. You could say Michael Laron said this and that like like this article did. No problems. Right. That what I was referring to with quoting and, and where you want to get permission and things like that is when you're when you're quoting someone in a book. Right, because it's it's different to quote someone in an article than to quote someone in a book. Because when you're quoting someone in an article, the the it's kind of implied that people are going to read it. And yes, the article could be monetized to a certain extent, but people don't think about that too much. But in a book, I mean, you're 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 getting money for this book, and so there's there's a copyright thing. So when you're doing articles and stuff, it's not as big of a deal. Um, when you're quoting folks in your books, that's where you want to. That's that's where you want to be a little bit more careful. And I think that's what Travis was referring to um, when he was talking about his book. But I don't know the, I don't know if I made that clear or not. But thanks for sharing that with me. That's it's always cool. It's always cool to see uh, see yourself pop up in the wild. <laughs> Cause uh, you know, I get the 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 go well, I sign up for the Google alerts and I think they're trash, man. I like I, the Google alerts are just garbage. Like they never work. Right? Because because if it worked then I would have known about this article. That's that's number one exhibit A, number one reason why Google alerts are trash. I, there's this other one where I, I, I sign up for it. I think it's called Talkwalker, and sometimes it lets me know when like people have mentioned me or something like that. But if anybody has um, has an app that you use or something like that that lets you know when people mention you, let me know because I would love to know it. It's been it's been an off and on struggle that I've had for the last ten years. You know, because I like to know when people are talking about me, even if, you know, they don't like something that that I did. Um, I still like to know about it because, you know, when someone mentions you, you always want to share it, that sort of thing. It's just common courtesy. 
All right. Uh, Drone Pro says, I did see Amanda Gorman's book of poems, Call Us What We Carry, at Target. I always look at what books Target is featuring. It's a very strong indicator of where they think the market is. Yeah, I think Target's gotten it wrong sometimes, though. Um, Target has a very sp- – Target's book section is geared toward a very specific demographic audience. Um, it's not necessarily indic- – like, like when I walk into Target, those aren't necessarily the books that I'm interested in, you know? Um, not to say that that's a bad thing. I, I just think that sometimes Target is misjudged. And I, it, it wouldn't surprise me if Target was as mercenary with their book section as Costco is. You know, it, it's exceedingly difficult to get your books into Target. Um, I have seen indies get their books into Target. I have seen it, but um, they're, they're a little mercenary. Um, so I, I don't know. Tar- I, th- I think they can be indicative of what the market is wanting. But, again, you just never really know. You never really know. And, again, it, um, Target, not everybody buys books at Target. In fact, I don't think I've ever bought a book at Target. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, I already answered Hunter's question. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, uh, Travis says, I quote you in my head all the time. All right. <laughs> uh, Wylan. Uh, who's your favorite hero, protagonist, in other writing, film, or media? Also, who is your favorite that you wrote? Uh, I, I like all my characters. Um, um, the Last Dragon Lord, my main character there, um, I, I have a fondness for him. Um, obviously, I love Lester Broussard in my Good Necromancer series. Um, as far as my favorite in other writing, um, as far as books, I would say Alex Cross. I uh, love Alex Cross. Um I love the, the protagonist in Treasure Island, uh, Jim Hawkins. Uh, hopefully, I, I think it's Jim Hawkins. Uh, Treasure Island, I love him. Uh, it's, in terms of other media, um, Leonardo from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You know, I, I guess I've got Shredder's Revenge on the brain, but um, yeah, I've always loved Leonardo. I've always been a Le- I'm a Leonardo type, so uh, Leonardo has always been um, fun for me. Um, John Luke Picard, Star Trek: The Next Generation. Um, yeah, those are probably some of my favorite uh, favorite heroes, uh, protagonists. I have a lot of them, though. I mean, there's a lot of protagonists that I really like, uh, but I, I tend I tend to gravitate toward the um, protagonist that kind of grabs the bull by the horns, charges into things, but likes to be smart about it, kind of thing. That's uh, I feel like that's me in life. At least that's what I aspire to be, anyway. All right. Luana, what is the difference between fiction and literary fiction? I'm going to twist your question a little bit, Luana. I hope you hope that's okay. I think what you're what you're meaning is what's the difference between um, commercial or speculative fiction and literary fiction? Well, to start, literary fiction is fiction that is meant to be written with the with the objective of the reading of the text itself being its reward. So with literary fiction, it's not uncommon for people to say things like, I, li- I like to read that book because it was challenging. It was tough, it was tough to, to grapple with because the imagery and the words on the page and the character and maybe the plot were difficult to untangle. Right, literary readers like to read for the sake of reading, and I don't, I don't mean that in a bad way, but they 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 enjoy text that is, um, in many ways, difficult, and the reason they enjoy that is because they believe that that gives them insights into the human condition and and what it means to live, because to live is a very difficult thing. So that's how I would define literary fiction. I don't know if some people would say it's an egghead definition. I don't read a whole lot of literary fiction anymore. I used to, though. Um, but, but commercial and speculative fiction tends to be more story-driven, more story and character-driven. So whereas literary fiction, you've got characters and you've got plot, but th- the predominant thing that, that just jumps out at the page is the writing. Whereas with speculative fiction, the focus is on the story and characters. Now, what I will tell you, though, is that there is such a thing as literary science fiction. And there is such a thing as literary fantasy. But generally speaking, science fiction and fantasy does not tend to be literary. Um, there are there are like speculative fiction writers who write almost at the level of literary literary writers. Um, in some cases, if you look at um, you know you look at like um, 
like literary magazine. Look, like if you look at like a literary magazine and then you look at a like a speculative like commercial fiction magazine, sometimes you can't tell the difference. And I don't I don't know if any other people have have noticed that, but sometimes the writing style has a like the, of literary writers and commercial fiction writers, some writers sometimes you can't tell the difference. That's just me uh, as somebody that has read has read magazines. But um, yeah, the speculative fiction tends to be more on the science fiction, fantasy, horror, romance, uh, those sort those sort of genres, and that tends to be what people think of when they think of commercial fiction. And a lot of people look down or people have looked down on commercial fiction because you know the writing isn't as you know, deliberate and, and difficult as literary fiction. But I just think that's a bunch of hooey. I, I, I tend to prefer speculative fiction. Maybe, maybe you know, I, I just, when I sit down and read a book, I don't enjoy giant blocks of paragraphs with words that I have to look up every 10 seconds with, you know, Latin names of flowers and crap. You know, I just don't, like, I, I grew out of that a long time ago. <laughs> I just want to read a book where stuff explodes. <laughs> But uh, that's just me, all right? So that is the difference. Uh, hopefully that was a, a good answer to your question. Uh, let's see what else is going on in the chat. Okay, uh, Gene, only got 213 done, but am encouraged. Well, that's fantastic. And okay, okay, Nicholas, you, you answered my question. By hanging lampshades, I mean adding something to a section that could have been perceived as an error or looked out of place. Okay, gotcha. Okay, cool. Uh, oh, he gave an example, too. Let's see. Uh, if a character has shoes he didn't have in the last scene, he might mention how nice it is that their host gave it to him. Okay. Thanks for explaining that. that that's interesting. I, like I said, I've never heard that before. Uh, dot C is my biggest step out of imposter syndrome was when I realized I am an accomplished author, even if not a best-selling author yet. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I mean, that's, that's, that's exactly it. I mean, everyone here is, everyone here is accomplished. I mean, you showed up by writing, all right? Cause a writer is someone who writes. So yeah, celebrate the journey, not the, not the destination. I love that. Uh, Sailor Twilight, always an editing power hour. This has been helpful. I hope to add more words when I watch the replay. Awesome. Hey, Lucinda, I've done more than I've ever done on my own in an hour. Love the community feel. I love that. Oh, well, thank you, Aaron. Thank you for what you do. I found your perspective on writing to be straight to the point and foundational. I've scoured YouTube for writing content, but yours seems quick and potent. Thanks. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Let's see. All right, more lampshade stuff. <laughs> I see the way I use hanging a lampshade isn't consistent with how others have used it. Others mean use it to mean calling attention to something that appears unrealistic and moving on. Okay. Uh, Wylan, who is your favorite villain of your own and in others' works? Um, I guess in my own work, favorite villain. Um, I... I guess the one that comes to mind, you know, the Good Necromancer book two, there's a villain in there that I thought was really interesting philosophically. Um, ph philosophically, uh, the, the villains in that series are all interesting ideas. Like the villain is like those villains are more what if questions, right? So like what if a vampire tried to cure their own vampirism? Like how how would that happen and what would they have to do for something like that? So I, I like I like that villain. She was fun. Um, I'm actually thinking about writing a spinoff series with her. I might do it. I might not. I don't know yet. We'll see. Um, so yeah, that would be the answer to that part of the question. Uh, as far as other villains, um, love Long John Silver from Treasure uh, Treasure Island is one of my favorite novels. Uh, Long John Silver is just a fantastic villain. Uh, I liked him a lot. Um, I would also say. Uh, other villains, um, I like Nicodemus from the Dresden Files. I thought he was a fantastic villain. Um, still sends chills down my spine thinking about some of those final scenes. Um, I think it was book five uh, in the Dresden series where he appears. Um, other villains that I liked, uh, Sephiroth, Final Fantasy VII. You know, I, I, I go back to Sephiroth. Um, 
and if if I if you like Sephiroth, then you gotta love Kefka from Final Fantasy VI because Sephiroth is just a Kefka light. So I guess I'd have to say Kefka over Sephiroth, but yeah. So those are a few that I can think of. Um, let's see. Okay, L. Can I use a line written to me in an email as an endorsement on the cover of my book? Uh, only if that. Only if they give you permission to do so. I, I would. Um, I would get their permission, which hopefully isn't a problem. Yeah, you never. The the, the thing is, you just never want to be misleading, right? So so if if you put an endorsement on your book or even in your book description, you never want to mislead readers. So one, you always want to make sure that 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 is actually an endorsement that you've received. I think all of us agreed, you know, you don't want to be fraudulent, which I don't think anyone following my audience or in my audience would be that way. (laughs) But yeah, you want to make sure you got the endorsement. Then you want to make sure you got the permission to get the endorsement. Then you want to make sure that the endorsement is in the proper context, right? And then you also want to make sure that people know where the endorsement came from. You do all those three things. That's the ethical, uh, ethical way to do it. But um, yeah, good luck with that. Uh, SD, uh, yeah, Margaret Atwood. I, I don't know what the context is, but yes, Margaret Atwood. Yes, um, she's a great writer. Let's see. Um, PB Jelly, I've seen posts in groups regarding revenue gained by writing to trend. While it clearly indicates or generates income, I stick with my own ideas. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I'm not a big fan of writing to market. Um, so this is going to be a little bit of a long answer. I think you should write the books that make you light up inside, right? So if that happens to be a book about a group of anthropomorphic vegetables overthrowing a civilization of processed foods, then write that book. You know, I, 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 I think that we are very poor judges of the market and where the market is going. I, I think if you had looked at the book market – 10 years ago, I don't think any of us could have predicted what would be popular from like a, a genre perspective today, right? So just because you write something that doesn't sell today, that doesn't mean that you won't find an audience for that book years into the future. Now, that now if every book you're writing, you had that philosophy, that may not always pan out, right? But I do think that if there's a book that's on your heart, I think it's you owe it to yourself to write that book. Now, there is also the other side of the equation, right? Where people, or the other side of the argument where people will say, well, but if you do that, then you're never going to make any money, right? So I think everybody agrees. I don't don't think anyone disagrees with, you want to find, if you can find it, the balance between art and commerce. And that's, that's, that's much easier said than done. <laughs> so for me, I, I think I found, I finally found it with my good necromancer series. I think I've, I, I've, I found the genre that I enjoy writing in. So in the beginning of my career, I was a serial genre hopper. I wrote interactive fiction. I wrote some different genres of sci-fi. I did space opera. I did some game lit. Um, I did, um, some other sci-fi stuff. I did a lot of short stories. I did fantasy. I did some um, like urban fantasy. I, I did what I like to call epic urban, which is like if urban fantasy and epic fantasy got together and had a baby, you know, it's what it would look like. Uh, I've done some other types of fantasy. And, and I, 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 I guess wrote the story. I guess followed the stories that I wanted to follow. And the result was that I was kind of all over the place. And then when I finally got to urban fantasy, I really enjoyed it. And I settled down in urban fantasy. And all of the novels that I've written over the past probably three to four years have been urban fantasy. And I think I'm finally at the point where I've written enough in the genre that, one, I, I understand the genre and I've read enough in it to, to feel like I'm proficient in it. Two, I've got enough product that I think readers are – more likely to take a chance on my work. And then three, I think I've just gotten better as a writer, you know? And so, but it took me 10 years to get to that point, you know? So, so I, I think it's very much a journey. And for some writers like me, I think you'll, you'll eventually land on that combination and that formula. That's like, okay, this is it. Right. And then 
you can you can write what you enjoy. Some people will maybe forever be serial genre hoppers, and that's okay too. I think you have to be realistic about uh, about about the prospects that uh, some of your books are going to do well, some of them might not, and I think you got to be okay with that. I think a lot of people want they want that improve like increasing success. Like you write one book, and then that means the next book is going to be even better, and then people want to see a like a straight line you know, all the way up. And that straight line is possible, but, um, you know, it's not the reality for most people. So like I said, I said this was going to be a long answer. To bring this back to writing to market, all right, I, if, if, you, if you don't do what I just said to do, which is, you know, follow the stories that bring you joy and that bring you enjoyment, then what ends up happening is you, you can write to trend, you can write to market, but you're not going to be happy doing it, you know, and then it's going to feel like a job. And then why would, you know, most of us, we, we have, we have jobs. So why, why would you, why would you trade one job for another? Like that's, that's my thing. It's like, you know, if I'm going to work a job and have, at least I'm going to have benefits and, (laughs) you know, have a salary and stuff. Why, why would I give all that up to, to, to work another job where I don't get any of those benefits and I write something that I don't like, like, to me, I just don't understand that. I just don't, I don't get that. So to me, it's very much about a happiness thing. Like I don't care. I don't really care about the money. Like you could give me boatloads of money, but if I wake up in the morning and I don't like writing detective novels, then, you know, is that really a win? Is that really a, a positive? But um, yeah, I, I also, I, I did a course. It's called um, How to Write to Market Without Selling Your Soul. And the funny thing about that course is I, I actually don't write to market in that I mean, I do, um, and actually, I'm I'm gonna go back and update that course because um, the Good Necromancer series is doing considerably better now that I've rebranded it and gotten new covers. Um, it's it's doing a lot better, and uh, I've actually rewrote the blurb a few weeks ago. And um, yeah, like like I would actually like if you had asked me a year ago, I would have said, yeah, that course that, that, that kind of told you everything, like what not to do. Um, now I can actually, I think I can actually say the methods that I used in that course actually worked. It was that I made some serious missteps with the cover the first time around with that, with that series. Um, and when I fixed that, I actually found out the stuff that I did in that course actually made a big difference. So, um, so anyway, that's a long way of saying that course. I actually, I think I found that combo of, um, you know, art and commerce, but anyway, um, super, super long ass question or answer to your question. (laughs) I hope you got something out of that PB jelly. All right. It's not a power hour without, without rambling. Oh, okay, SD. Um, yeah, Margaret Atwood is considered to be a literary fiction writer who writes speculative fiction. I agree with that. That is, I, yeah, that's that's a good, um, good assessment of Margaret Atwood. Because yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily like if you know, Handmaid's Tale is sci-fi, but I wouldn't, I would call it sci-fi. Like if you actually read the book, you know, it is very literary. Hey, Travis, thank you so much for the super chat. I really appreciate it. As always, a productive, informative, and drovable power hour. Go Donatello. Hey, I like Donnie. I like Donnie. If I had to, if I had to rank my turtles, though, um, it would be Leonardo, Raph, Donnie, and then Mikey. Although, I probably shouldn't say this, spoiler alert. M- M- Mikey, I-, I-, I like Mikey a lot more now after the most recent Ninja Turtle comic the last Ronin. That's all I'm going to say. Um, thought that was fantastic. That was a lot of fun to read when I was down and recovering. So yeah, Donnie's, Donnie's cool too. Uh, PB jelly, uh, Sephiroth, love him. Yeah. Sephiroth is good stuff. I'm really curious to see how they uh, treat him in the remake part two of, uh, FF seven. Yeah. Wyland says FF villains are in a league of their own. Are they though? I don't know. Um, Kefka Sephiroth, Maybe Seymour. The rest of them, uh, uh, I don't know. You know, I, Ultimisha from Final Fantasy VIII. She's kind of forgettable. Um, not, 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 not like, 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 not amazing. Um, Kuja from Final Fantasy IX was okay. You know, but still, 
eh. Um, what was his What was his name? The the ridiculous uh, Vane from Final Fantasy XII. Not really that good of a villain. Oh, Arden from Final Fantasy XV. I would put him in the category with Sephiroth in that group. So yeah, yeah. I guess you're right. I guess you're right, Wylan. Um, it's just that when the villains and when the villains of Final Fantasy are really good, they're amazing. But when they're not, they're just kind of mediocre. They're kind of hit or miss, you know. <laughs> All right. I love my Final Fantasy guys. Okay. Um, hey, Marcus, Marcus D. Uh, my question is, what word count do you try to reach with a novel? After several drafts, my manuscript seems short. Should I add more? Yeah. I mean, there is no, there is no like. There are people that will fight you to the death on this question. And I just think people waste so much breath and calories on this. To me, a novel is as long as it needs to be. Now, if you've got a 10,000-word manuscript, can you call that a novel? No, probably not. Okay, But if it's 30,000 or 40,000 words, who the hell cares? I mean, that's just my opinion. But anyway, I, I, I just get irritated when people argue over this. Um, so the novel really should be as long as as it should be. I aim, you know, most of my stuff tends to be between 50 and 60,000 lately. Like my good necromancer series is almost always pretty close to 50. Um, I think all of them, the novels are pretty close to 50. Um, book five might be like 46, 47, something like that. Um, my rat shifter series um, tends to be no less than 60, but, you know, it, it just kind of is what it is. So what I would say, Marcus, is is if look at the story. If, if you feel like the story is complete, then the story is complete. I wouldn't add any more to it. I wouldn't take anything away from it. Because if you do that, then readers are going to notice. Because readers, re- readers love books, but they hate when authors pad them. You know, I mean, just look at traditionally published books. I mean, just look at how many traditionally published books that you could probably take out 30% of the story and it would not impact the plot, right? Like readers, they just don't, they don't like that. Um, But they also don't like, they also don't like it when it feels really short too. So like if you've got, if you've got a 20,000 word book or a 10,000 word book and you call it a novel, they might call you out on that a little bit. But you know, if you're if you're in the forty thousand mark, fifty thousand mark, you know, high thirties, I've called those novels and no one's ever said anything about it. So, you know, that's Michael Laron's opinion, of course. Uh, Wyland, I love your urban fantasy, but I still say my personal favorites are Galaxy Mavericks and Android X. Maybe that's just because they were my introduction to you. Yeah, people have been asking me to go back to Android X. I might at some point in the future. Um, there, there's, there are still some stories I want to tell in that universe, but uh, yeah, I'm not saying I won't ever go back to sci-fi, but um, definitely finding, uh, finding my enjoyment right now from fantasy. Tom Fowler, writing to market has become muddled term over the years. I've heard Sasha Black use the term writing to reader, and I think I like it better. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, um, I, I've never heard Sasha say that, but I, that's 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 accurate. Um, you, it might be more accurate to say writing to the readership, you know, because every reader's different, you know. So, but that's that's an interesting observation. Okay, yeah, PB. Uh, so, okay, thanks for the response. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, Wylan, I do consider Kingdom Hearts as Final Fantasy, so I count those villains too. Um, don't get me started on Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> don't don't just just don't don't. We're not even going to talk about Kingdom Hearts protagonists. Okay, but villains. No, no. Kingdom Hearts is or it, Kingdom Hearts is just for the birds, man. I mean, I love that series, but the storytelling in that series is just like it's just an example of how not to tell a story. Like it's so convoluted; it doesn't make sense. Like, you, like I used to love video games back in the day when you didn't need a mobile game, like, and a bunch of other spinoffs and stuff to understand the main story, but. We're going to stop. We're just going to stop. Uh, Marcus, I like Kuja's theme. Yeah, Kuja, Kuja had a really cool theme song. Uh, absolutely true. Um, I play F- FF14. The stories for Shadowbringers and Inwalker are amazing. I have not played FF14. Um, um, everybody tells me that it's it's pretty fit. Fa- every, everybody tells me that the, f- the first, like I guess it was the first one, kind of sucked. But then the sequels were like amazing. Like, apparently they figured it out. So, um, 
I'll have to check it out at some point. I actually I actually have not played it could surprise you guys, but I actually have not played uh video games for like 10 years. <laughs> I just watch them on YouTube. If you can believe that. All right, um dot C KH3 was such a disappointment. Yeah, there was a lot of things about that that um just didn't work out. I think the big thing for me like I, I think they forgot their roots. Like, there's no Final Fantasy, like almost no Final Fantasy characters in it. Like, that was the whole, like that was the whole premise of Kingdom Hearts. It was because um, a Disney exec and a Square Enix exec got stuck in an elevator at some point and were like talking about it, and so it was a partnership between Kingdom Hearts, like Disney and, and it just didn't, it, the three just didn't seem like it, and. Also, the other thing is just the recycling of the worlds is something I think is a little weird, too. I mean, I like the Hercules world, but it's just like, does it have to be in every single entry? I don't know. That's just me. Um, but we'll see. seems like Hades is going to play a big part in Kingdom Hearts 4, though, so we'll see uh, We'll see how that goes. Uh, Wylan, I totally agree. I have a stubborn love for KH because of its impact on me when I was young. It is unreasonably convoluted and organized, disorganized. The first, the first one is not. Um, the second one kind of is, and then it just gets kind of, um, just kind of gets ridiculous. <laughs> kind of gets ridiculous. <laughs> but yeah, I played it too. I think it was. It's. I always like to use the example. It's kind of like. Um, it's kind of like Catcher in the Rye. Like you got to read that book at just the right time in your life. There's like there's a there's a very narrow window in your life when you read Catcher in the Rye on on whether you're going to love it. If you read it outside of those windows, it'll be the worst book you ever read. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it hit me at just the right time too, I think. Um, it hit me at just the right time. I was young enough that, well, I, I, was, I, I had Final Fantasy on the brain all the time, but then I was still young enough to love Disney, like to still have a lot of fondness and admiration for like the old, the golden era of Disney animation. And I think that's why it was a hit. Um, particularly for like younger people. All right. Uh, I play, I played 1.0 and it did suck. The interface for final fantasy 14 interface and, and such were awful. They corrected it with a realm reborn. The stories vary according to the expansion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's actually really interesting. Um, I, I think the same team that did 14 is doing 16 now. And uh, 16 looks really, really interesting. Um, it's like a mix of like final fantasy and devil may cry which you guys know I love Devil May Cry too. So um, I think that's 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 going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> All right, Wyland says, are we the same age? I'm, I'm going to be 35 next month, Wyland. I'm going to be 35. So I, I, I can no longer say I'm, well, I guess I'll be on the back end of uh, back end of my 30s. So crazy, crazy stuff. All right, well, I'm starting to see the questions uh uh, drip off everybody. So just want to remind folks in case you missed it at the beginning of the call. Um, I do have two free audiobooks available, the author estate handbook and the author air handbook. They are in the video description of this video. I put them up on YouTube for everyone to listen to. Let me know what you think. I am going to be putting up more audiobooks uh, for my indie author confidential series. Those are narrated by Google AI kind of just an easy thing that the, the series doesn't really do doesn't really do that much and so uh, i think uh putting it up on youtube and we'll get it some more exposure all right so um should should be should should be fun so uh and then the other thing is let's look at the let's look at the calendar here real quick we we should be back on a regular schedule for our next power hour apologies that i had to that we had to to move this one but uh fourth of july i just didn't want to uh, make people meet on the 4th of July or the 4th of July weekend. All right. So we are looking at, uh, we are looking at Saturday, August 6th at 10 a.m. Central Time. All right. And then um, probably we'll have another one in August because I'll be doing Beast Mode. And then I want to look at uh, uh, September. Uh, okay, so I might I might do I'm actually Labor Day here in the United States is that first week of September. I think I might actually still do the Power Hour that weekend, um, just because then we have a pretty pretty straight shot to the end of the year. All right, because I don't want to move it unless I have to. So uh, next Saturday, August sixth, will be our Power Hour. Okay, 
And I do see some questions coming in finally, uh, some final questions. Um, if you ever visit California, I'd love to meet you and get some autographs. Well, I will let you know, Wylan. Um, I was supposed to be in San Diego last year, but it didn't work out because of the pandemic. But, uh, yeah, I always like to let people know when I'm going to different events and stuff. So, all right. Carry it. Thank you, and thank you for the word counts. Um, Marcus asks, how much do I charge for beta reading? I don't do beta reading, Marcus, um, but your average beta reader, you know, mostly most of them will be free. But if you do charge, I mean, you can kind of charge what you can afford. Let's see. All right, SD, going on vacation. Well, enjoy the conference. I, I, I look forward to watching it, and um, uh, I'll look forward to seeing you in August. So it'll be fun. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for a wonderful Power Hour. I will plan on seeing you next month, August 6th at 10 a.m. Central Time. Happy writing, and talk to you soon. Take care.